a happy day, a sunny street. You're young and in love, and life is good. And you're on your way to lunch when suddenly a cold shadow falls. And then <laughs> you feel a cold, slimy hand touch your face. <laughs> and it's your own hand. <laughs> That's evil. Where does evil come from? Whose fault is it? The American Council for Remorse, a non-profit organization working on the greater part of people who do terrible things, brings you a piece where we encounter Wally. Take it off. Take it all off. The na the Dwight. Dad, can we discuss this? The father. Oh, bring on the fat calf. Let's eat and be merry. The narrator. A multitude of other characters. Have you seen another station? You ever feed swine before? Life's a feast. That's so beautiful. It's closing this time, Mr. Wally. To you. Here. Let me help you. And the piano player. <laughs> In. Market in partnership with my two sons, my prodigal son Wally Aww. and uh, mother son White. Aww. One day, about uh, two years ago, I came down to breakfast in New Wally. <sighs> morning, Dwight. Morning, Dad. Man, you see your brother this morning? He's uh, still in bed. But I promised Harry Shepard I'd be down to his house by 7.30. He's got a lot of sheep out there on the mountain, wild and steep. It says here that fatted cows are down one and three quarter shekels on the Damascus market, Dad. Makes me wonder if maybe lean cows wouldn't have a higher profit margin. And then we can spend more time in the vineyard. Dad, are you even listening to me? I'm worried about your brother. Come on, Dad, you've, you've got to move ahead or, or you're going to lose ground. I mean, look at the stewards. They're buying a land left and right. Good uh, morning, Dad. Morning, boy. Man, you look a little pink there, son. Uh, I don't know, Dad. Maybe it's uh, some kind of morning sickness. I mean, I'll feel all great at night. And then when I wake up, I just hurt all over. Well, I did notice a couple of empty wineskins by the fig tree this morning. Uh, I was taking them back there and they spilled, honest. Well, uh, where were you taking them? Uh, I was taking them outside, Dad. You know, uh, wine's gonna breathe. And so do I, Dad. I have a real serious breathing problem right here, Dad. I was reading in the Assyrian Digest the other day that, uh, bad feelings could be environmental. Which is why I was sort of wondering if I could get away for a while. Uh, get my head on straight and work some things out, Dad. Well, uh... If that's how you... Dad, I was sort of wondering if I could take my share of the farm. Head to a far out land. Until I get my feet back underneath me, head wise, and come back a brand new man, Dad. Dad, could we discuss this? <sighs> and not many days later, the younger son gathered his inheritance and took his journey into a far land. I'm walking, walking to a far out land, and I'm talking. Talking, got cash in hand, and I'm hot now. Don't you understand? You're looking at a brand new man. Oh, hey, who's this? What's shaking, babes? Oh, no, senor. I was just taking these five foolish virgins home. We were supposed to be at a wedding an hour ago. Pero, they ran low on oil. Have you seen an oil station down that way? Well, uh, they don't look like very foolish people to me, but, uh, tell you what, I could go take them to get oil on my treat. Sorry, senor. I've got to look out for these virgins myself. They take a lot of supervision. You've got to watch them pretty close so they don't walk up each other's backs. <laughs> Whoops. Dropped your lamp in it. Good thing it didn't have any oil in it. <laughs> well, bye now. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. We're moving. Moving down that old highway. We're improving. Improving. Every day. And we're grooving. Grooving. And we're okay. And he took his journey into a far land. And there wasted his substance in riotous living. Oh, take it off! Oh, take it all off! Snap it back on again? We're taking it off again! Oh, yeah. oh, hey, you Pharisees, loosen up over there, would you? Uh, piano man. 
You know, hey Judea, hey Judea, you're a real great place. You're the best dad in the Bible. You're out there decking down in Galilee. You are family. You are tribe. Oh, hey, publican, another round of wine for me and my bowels here, would you? Yeah! What is this, light wine? You don't like it? No! Feed it to those virgins and bring me your best. I'll give you a chat to take with you. It's closing time, Mr. Wally, now do do. All right, all right. Hey, I'm paying. Let's party. Oh, Wally, you're so joyful. So many people with a farm background, they don't know how to let go and have such a good time. <laughs> Not me, Wanda. Life is a feast if you know where to find it. Life's a feast? That's so beautiful! So many people make such restrictions on themselves. But not you. You have a better sense of who you are. You believe in a smile, not denial. In festivity, not negativity. Well, sure, rules are good for people who need them, but you prefer freedom. You have this wonderful, this, this such, well, it's not a structured thing. Your energy is so focused. Why the locust? <laughs> well, that was all my money. I spent every, everything I had. Amazing. Are you all right, Tom? Do you need to ride home? No. Uh, Wally, listen. It's been great. The best three weeks of my life. Bye! And when he had spent all, there arose across a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and lived with a farmer who took him into his fields to feed his wife. <coughs> Get your feet, swam before. Uh, no, but I fed cats. So it's basically the same thing. You have to get swam down right now, right? Man, it's a lot more to it than that. She, uh, usually we require swine baiters to have at least do their uh, four years of professional experience. But I tell you what, I can put you in my internship program. Uh, what does it pay? Pay? I'm offering you to learn the swine business from the mud up. You mean I'll eat and sleep out here with the pigs? <laughs> Man, you want it or not? Uh, fine, I'll take it. I, I just had to get it clear in my own mind, that's all. Well, hey, come on! Oh, hey. Hey. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? Yet I, perish with hunger. Well, I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee, and shall no more be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. No. No, that doesn't sound too good. I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, it was a great learning experience, and now I'm back. Looking for an entry level position. No. Nah. I will arise. I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Hi, Daddy. How you been? Oh, I'm fine. Gee, thanks for asking. Uh, say, you got anything to eat around here? Yeah. And he arose and came to his father. I'm walking. Aww. Back home again. I'm talking. Oh, no cash in my head. I'm so cold now. Oh, yeah. Don't you understand? You're looking at a ruined man. Let me help you. I heard you crying from afar. Oh man, please let go. Everything's gonna be all right. I'll bind your wounds here. I don't have any wounds. Now please let go. Are you sure I can't help in any possible way? I'm sure. Now please let go. Are you positive? I'm positive. Now please let go. Well, okay. <gasps> Bye. Boy, sometimes those Samaritans just won't take no for an answer. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion <gasps> on him. And they ran to each other. And his father fell. <laughs> but he got back up and he dusted himself off. And they continued to run to each other. And then they realized that if they ran faster, they would arrive sooner. Sooner. 
I just rather fell onto his ass like and oh, Daddy! Oh, Molly! Oh, sorry, Molly! Hey, you can breathe too close! And some shoes! And some rings! Not the dress shoes! The party shoes! I made that two rings! Uh, Dad, I spent all the money. Oh, more rings! More rings! Another fatty cat! Oh, man, Wally, you look great! Have you lost the weight? Well, uh, I have been on a high S diet, Dad. Hey, Dwight, look who's here. It's Wally. Hi. Nice to see you. Oh, man, boy, we're having a field tonight. Wally's home. I'll tell you what, Dad, I'm going to go get some of that fatty calf. Be right back. Oh, okay. Dad, I don't want this to sound negative in any way, but how many years have I been working for you? All your life. And have I ever disobeyed you, Dad? Never. And have you ever thrown me a big party for me and my friends? Well, no. But the minute not. you, but the minute this bozo comes hooping at home, this, this, this loser. But your brother was dead. Now he's alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying, Dad. You never ran up to me and hugged me. I would just like to point that out. Uh -huh. I guess I'm not a hugger. Oh, Dad. I brought some of my friends back. I hope you don't mind, but, uh, hey, you want some of this fatty calf? Oh. Fatty calf? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, it sure says mm. some good fatty calf, Dad. Oh, it's delicious. Oh, it sure does beat us, you know. Mm. Oh, this fat won't keep you, no, Dad. Mm. Hey, you want, some more of the, you want some more of this fatty calf? Ever stop to think who fatted that calf, Wally? That was our best calf, Dad. The best one. Try to think how I feel. I'm hoeing corn all day. I come in bone tired and there's my brother smelling of pig manure. And they've got the beer on ice and my cap on the barbecue. My cap! And my ring, oh, my ring on his hand. You promised it to me, Dad, but oh no! Can't give it to the son who's worked his tail off for 30 years. Gotta give it to the weasel who comes dragging his butt through the door. Great, Dad. Wonderful. Terrific. Maybe I'll go sleep with the pig, seeing as you go for that. See you later, Wally. Take the rest of my stuff. Clothes, jewels, shekels, just take whatever you want. Take my room. Don't worry about me. I'll be in the pig pen. The prodigal. The prodigal. The prodigal son! sensitive. Then who? Well, then men. Oh, yeah. Like, they don't like it when you spring a leak. Spring a leak? It's an expression. Oh, you mean take a leak. That's what I said. No, you said spring a leak. No, no one says spring a leak. You just did. I do not spring leaks. Well, uh, neither do I. Well, sometimes I do. The Vietnam War left many wounded veterans in its wake. In this cutting, we meet Gaby, a naive young guy, and Silvio, a streetwise, self-proclaimed ladies' man, recovering from their injuries in an army hospital. Differences in upbringing, education, and class collide as this unlikely duo gradually become friends through random acts. Motivated by a greater need, human connection, Private Wars by James McClure.
You know what else makes you feel like an old man? An old woman? Garters. You're right. You're darn right I'm right. I wear garters to my brother's <sighs> wedding. Well, it didn't make it feel like an old man? You're darn right it did. Besides, the garters didn't even work. Well, what kind of socks were you wearing? Athletic socks. You wore athletic socks to your brother's wedding. You see, Gately, I'm Catholic. Oh, did the Pope make you do it? Don't get cute with me, Gately. It was his second wedding. First time around, I wore regular black socks. But the second marriage? I figured what the heck. Now, I'd like to return for a moment to the subject of underwear. All right. Now, floppy versus tight. For me, there's really no comparison, because what's a guy looking for in underwear? Fashion? Certainly fashion. I mean, you're with a chick, right? You don't want her taking off your pants and have her laugh at your underwear, right? Uh, well, she might if you're wearing flocky underwear. Uh, that's why you have to get a good pattern. Oh. Take a look at these. Are these smart or what? Huh. Those are pretty smart. My sister bought me these. Your sister has good taste in men's underwear. Of course. Yeah. It kind of makes you wonder, though. What? Just, how did your sister get such good taste in men's underwear? Hey, what are you saying, buddy? Just say. Listen, the way I see it, a guy needs fashion and a guy needs freedom. Other than that, there's really nothing else a guy needs. Snugness? Uh-oh. Do I sense the voice of a tight underwear man here? Well, a guy doesn't always want floppy underwear. Now, wait a minute. Underwear are like socks. Stop. I don't think I can let this go by. Look, a guy doesn't want his socks slipping down. Man wants snug socks. Snug socks. Socks are like underwear. What kind are you wearing? Black ones. Are they tight? Oh, yeah. They're pretty tight. They're not black silk, are they? Uh, black polyester. The mine has holes in them. Well, of course they have holes in them. It's a modern convenience. I got holes on the balls. Holes on the balls. Holes on the balls. I gotta get some new ones. I would guess so. You know, I also kind of have this problem here. My left is bigger than my right. Well, how much of a difference could there be? Uh, about an inch. My left's about nine inches long. What? My right's about ten. Nine and ten inches? You know, I really need to get some new socks. <coughs> You were talking about your socks. That's good for your socks. You might want to get some new socks. What? I don't want to talk about it. Gately, I've been thinking of buying a kilt. A kilt? Yeah! It's a kind of dress that Scottish people wear. It's kind of like a cheerleader skirt. Oh, if you want to wear a cheerleader skirt, why don't you go out and get one? I don't want to wear a cheerleader skirt. What would I do with a cheerleader skirt? I don't know. Hey, wait a minute. You think I want to wear a girl's dress. Is that what you think? Look, I don't care. Look, I don't care. Then you don't care. Who cares? Not me. Look, I don't want to wear a dress, okay? Okay. I want to wear a kilt. So I said to myself, what do Scottish people have that I don't have? Kilts? Oh, hey, gorgeous. Hey, beautiful. Come on, be honest. Say what you gotta say. You know what you wanna know. What? Have you ever asked yourself how I got such an incredible power over women? Oh, no. How the nurses can't resist me. Oh, the nurses hate you, Silvio. <laughs> That's what they would want you to think. Well, they got me thinking it. <laughs> you wanna hear a great line for picking up girls? Sure. This one works best for Catholic girls. You tell them you're a priest. A priest? All right, look. We'll set the scene. This is what they call setting the scene. We're sitting here at this table. What could this table be? A table? Okay, we'll make it a table. And we are in a nightclub. Can it be a singles joint? Gately, you ever been to a singles joint? No. All right, I'll tell you what. I'm setting the scene here, so we'll make it a singles joint. Where'd you learn all this? One time I hung around a USO group. A Bob Hope thing. I'll tell you something, Gately. Yeah? Never be afraid to mingle in the arts. Okay. All right. So you're sitting here at this table, and you are a bride. 
What's a nice girl like me doing in a place like this? That's it, that's it. That's what it's called. Getting into character. Am I lonely? Are you lonely? With a face like that, what do you think? I'm lonely, huh? That's right. You're like ugly girls all over the world. You're like a different breed. You sit there being ugly, ruining life for everybody else. Are you lonely? Gately, I'm a priest. Of course I'm lonely. I'm one of the loneliest men on the face of the earth. All right. So you are sitting here ugly and lonely. I come in. I come over. Hey, look, a priest. What are you doing? I was, uh, saying hello. Gately, you don't know I'm a priest. But don't you got your priest shirt on? No. I'm being casual. You don't got your your, your thing on? No. My thing? Your 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 collar thing? No. But aren't you being mysterious? Very. Aren't you being like scary? Gately, I don't want to scare you. Oh, like Dracula! Gately, you don't listen to me anymore. That worries me. Look, we will do it for a second time. You are sitting there ugly and lonely. I come in. I'm looking around, checking things out. You don't see me yet, Gately. I see you. I come over and I say, pardon me, miss. Is this seat taken? Uh, why, yes, it is. What? Buzz off! What are you doing? Do you want me to call the manager? That's not how this goes. No, child, Miss Pig. Gately, what? Quit giving me such a hard time, okay? I was just being realistic. You're being too realistic. Look. We will do it for a third time. You, ugly, lonely. I come in. I'm looking around, checking things out. You don't see me yet, Gately. I see you. I come over and I say, pardon me, miss. Is this seat taken? Well, why not? Mind if I sit down? Sure. Mind if I order you a drink? Well, why not? Bartender, two of the same. I hope you won't think I'm being too personal, but what's your name? Woodruff Gagley. Woodruff? Woodruff. I've never known women to be named Woodruff before. Well, you've never known a woman like me. I hope you won't think I'm being too nervous, but have you ever been to a place like this? I'm Baptist. You must be very lonely. <laughs> Why? Because I'm Baptist? May I tell you something very personal? Uh, sure, if it don't get smut. I don't get a chance to meet beautiful women such as yourself too often. You see, actually, I'm a priest. Oh, well, you see, I don't get a chance to meet much men. You see, I like other women. That's it, Fergie! What? You know, I'm trying to give you the benefit of my experience. My life! Why on earth would you make her a lesbian? I don't know! A priest can't pick up a woman like that! Nobody could pick up a woman like that! Another woman could? That does me no good, Gately. I can't become a woman every time I want to get a date. I know you can't. You see my point? You can become a transvestite! A what? You wear women's clothes. I don't want to wear women's clothes. You want to wear kilts! That's right. Which is uh, nearly close enough to women's clothes. You know what? This is a big waste of time. From now on, buddy, you're on your own. What? And I wish what? you luck. Because what? at this rate, what? you may never what? get a what? date. What? Far in far Bombay, come 
fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. If only travel these days could compare to that of the glamorous 1950s, with Payne Ann Stewardess's smiling good morning, and a Frank Sinatra song to narrate your journey. Now, travel is no longer a luxury, but rather a huge pain in the tarmac. Let's see how one passenger in particular endures everything from crazy TSA agents to passengers who deserve to be shoved into the overhead compartment. Will this traveler's experience crash and burn? Buckle up and prepare for turbulence as we witness this poor woman try to catch Flight 212 to LA by Darcy Roth. Hi, checking in for Flight 212 to Los Angeles, please. One twelve leaves in 30 minutes. You'll have to use the special express line. But, but I'm on 212. In which case, you're overzealously early. License, body pass, and most, be and most recent blood sample. Police. Blood sample? Wait, what nationality are you? Oh, okay, never mind. Checking any bags today? Just to carry on. Please ensure that your carry-on will fit into the allotted overhead luggage compartment and be prepared to lift it into <laughs> and remove it from said compartment entirely by yourself. <sighs> You're all set. We appreciate your business. Yes, I can tell. Boy, things must have been so different back in the old days when everything was all pan and movie stars. License boarding pass, how would you please recite your social security number? Backwards. Excuse me? Ha ha ha! TSA humor. We like to keep things light around here. Right, because your job calls for a lot of them joking around. Okay, shoes off, belt off, please remove any necklaces, bracelets, earrings, rings, bell rings, nose rings, tarnings, or any other metal or ring light material that may interfere with our scanners. I'm not wearing any jewelry. Oh. Has anyone attempted to give you something to bring onto this flight today? No. Has your luggage been left unattended or unseen since you last packed it? No. Are you single? And if so, do you find me attractive? Excuse me? Ha ha ha! Got you again. Okay, last thing left. Time for a little S, S, and S. What? What on earth is S, S, and, and S? Stick out the arms, spread the legs, and stand still. You've been randomly selected for a passenger body suit. Oh, oh, lucky me. Nice leg muscles. Oh, abs need a little bit of work, though. <laughs> Excuse me? Ha <laughs> ha, just kidding, you're out great too. And hey, congratulations. You're officially weapon and contraband free. Have a nice flight. Okay. Flying bureaucracy, creepy TSA agents, thank God that's over. I've got two hours to the flight and a newsstand to check out lots of magazines. Oh! Oh! So sorry. Didn't mean to jostle ya. That's quite alright. It is a bit crowded in here. Airports can definitely be so stressful, don't you think? They are a bit of a pain. Thomas makes you wish you could ship yourself in the mail sometimes. <laughs> ah, I tried that once, but then the postal service almost had me arrested. <sighs> Would you like some pills? <gasps> oh, I got some right here in my fanny pack. I got <gasps> Dalian Percent and I said, oh, I forget what these purple ones are called. You know what? That's really quite all right. Yeah, no. My mother witnessed one of the first plane crashes ever in the North Woods, Minnesota. You don't say. My father was in an airplane in 1973 and the engine caught on fire. Oh my gosh, that's so terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, he lived. So I did everyone. Oh, my fly makes me a little tense. Are you tense? No, not particularly, no. Oh, oh, you can tame it, you know, just with a little bit of deep breathing, like this. Can I hold your hand? You know 
like, oh, you're afraid of the germs, aren't you? That's okay. I got some Purell right here in my baby. You know what? I think I am not being cold. Let's see what you. Walk my fast, walk my fast. Head up the side, head up the side. Oh, the universe is sending me a sign. I, I just need to catch the tram, find my gaze, and then be nice and anti-social until I get to Los Angeles. The tram. Listen, I don't care if he's busy, miss whoever you are. I need you to get him out of that meeting. Stay it! Excuse me? Morty! Morty! We got a mother's rights, Marty! Mother's rights! I'm telling you this deal needs to go down now! Excuse me? Sir? We're gonna make history here, Martin. I don't understand why you're hesitating over one environmental regulation law. Excuse me, sir? Listen, I know how to get around the EPA. Excuse me, sir? Hang on, Marty. Yes? We're in a cell phone free zone. Uh-huh. Marty, can you get Chuck on the line? Let's make this a three-way. Sir, I'm sorry to insist, but what you're doing is dangerous. Did you not see the sign? <clears throat> the use of cellular telephones and airport tram can interfere with airline number. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, I can read the sign. But here's the deal, sister. This phone call could change my life. Your life. And the lives of every single person in this airport. That being said, I think that sign applies to everyone else's phone calls, except for mine. Chuck! Chuck! Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm getting off the tram, right? Thankfully, so am I. Honestly, are there any more obnoxious videos I can meet here today? Excuse me, little missy. You wouldn't happen to know where the flat of Vegas is, would ya? I never should have asked that question out loud. No, I'm sorry. I don't know where the flight to Las Vegas is. I'm on the 212 to Los Angeles. That Marilyn Monroe lives out there in LA, don't she? Me and her are doing a picture together. That's, that's great. So, how long have you been doing impersonations? I mean, your outfit is actually really, really great. It must be fun being the fat Elvis. Oh, I'm skinny Elvis. I just have no acne in these steady jumpsuits. Right, well, I don't mean to bother you like some hound dog. Aha, aha, but there's my gate. Have fun in Vegas with Marilyn. Thank you very much. Everyone at this gate is potentially dangerous. I mean, any one of them could subject me to the random insanity on the plane. All three whole hours with nowhere to run. I could hide in Lady Slew. No. No. It's actually kind of strange. I mean, everyone here is actually acting normal. I mean, it's so quiet. I, I can actually hear someone. I can hear someone breathing. <laughs> Good 
Jagiada sees Jagiada? You know, I completely forgot to ask, but you'll have to excuse me for the next three hours. I've got my noise cancelling therapy session. Ah, oh, yes. Three more. Welcome to Big Stoop Week here on National Anthropologic Channel. I'm your host for the week, Eliza Woodburn. Now, you'll remember that yesterday we had a really up close documentary on Athleticorus idiotinus. But you better know these big fellas as the blockhead jock. Today, we're going to take a look at another one of high school's social extremities Dictimus Dramatis. The theatre. Like many high school cliques, the theater community is full of stereotypes, some true and others false. In today's episode of Big Student Week, The Theater Nerd, we will first venture through the wardrobe jungle and experience the different appearances that the Dictimus Dramaticus has. Next, we will pop on over to the urban watering hole and experience the different hangout habitats of the theater nerd. And finally, we will safari across the performance plane to see the different behavioral traits of the Dictimus Dramaticus. So pack up your scripts, don your berets, and let's get started. Now, the wardrobe jungle is where you'll be able to witness three Dictimus Dramatica, all in very different yet common appearances, interpretive, classical, and musical. Now, when you see someone wearing all black with a classic beret, Chances are he's an interpretive theater nerd who uses his performances to stick it to the man. Actors in this type of garb are usually in productions where you really have no idea what the plot is or what exactly they're trying to say. Classic theater nerds, on the other hand, wear what we normal people envision as regular costuming. There is no glitz and glamour underlying meaning here, just straight up clothing. Classic costuming can also be referred to as Shakespeare. The colorful tights, the puffy sleeves, those weird neck collars that no one really seems to understand. Suffice it to say that when you think theater, you think classic. And then we have the musical theater nerd. Theater nerds within this classification usually have an outrageously colored or obnoxiously glittery coat, which are usually more complex than they appear. They tend to have several different undercoats and tons of magnets for all of those unnecessary costume changes just because they can afford it. Along with many appearances for the stage, the Dictimus Dramaticus also has a special appearance for the hunting ground, better known as the street scene. This appearance is often confused with that of the hipster, but the main difference here, folks, is functionality. Note the thick rimmed wide lens glasses of the species. Hipsters wear these spectacles and say, Hey, I don't know a lot of people wear these kind of glasses, and that's exactly why I wear them. I love being different, and my glasses help me do so. Theater nerds, on the other hand, wear these and say, <laughs> Over the span of so many years, I've read so many small printed scripts that this is the only strength of prescription I wear I can use. <laughs> the same goes for hats and scarves of the species. Hipsters wear these accessories and say, The only hats worn these days are ball caps, and scarves are a lost art. I'm bringing them back into style, whether society likes it or not. Theater nerds wear these and say, <laughs> I didn't have time to brush the paint out of my hair, nor did I remember to erase the awkward makeup meets costume line around my collarbone. So rather than just wash up like a regular person, I'll just cover up my proof of negligence. <laughs> All right, kittens, now that you've seen the different appearances of the Dictimus Dramaticus, let's pop on over to the urban water pool, where we will see the different hangout habitats. Now, contrary to popular belief, theater nerds are not, in fact, socially awkward hermits. Well, mostly. They thrive in a variety of different habitats both on stage and off. For those who are theatrically ignorant, 
There is more to the theater than just the stage, but the environment of choice for the Dictimus Dramaticus is just that, the house. The house is where real acting is done, and it's commonly referred to as the theater nerd's comfort zone. Along with the house, another favorite is the props attic. This is where Dick and Mr. Match Guy go to play pretend and escape the fiery wrath of that angry stage manager looking for someone else to yell at besides their poor lonely cat truffles. And finally, we have the costume dungeon. This is where Dick and Mr. Match Guy go to rehearse lines, fun over the visually artistic talent they wish they could have, borrow fun accessories, and get some free tailoring done in the process. Though it may seem that theater nerds don't get out much, they do, just not in places that everyone else does. And when they are in a widely used public space, you are sure to notice them. Take coffee shops, for instance. In the eyes of the theater nerd, it's the perfect place to get a double grande mocha cream with extra steam foam syrup and hold the coffee, please, right after a long rehearsal. It's the best place for everyone to witness them working on that amazing freelance script they've been writing for the past year and a half but they just can't seem to figure out how that protagonist should meet an untimely end. Along with coffee shops, hole-in-the-wall bookstores are also a... a <laughs> no, guys, not the big building. The little one next to it. I did say hole-in-the-wall, after all. Anyway, these little shops are the best place for theater nerds to meet other dictumist dramatic guy who love spending 20 whole minutes contemplating a possible script just to come to the conclusion that it doesn't have the right emotion that I'm looking for. And finally, where else would theater nerds get their fun, hip clothing besides indie boots, boutique stores? Little do most people know that these hip, lofty spaces can only be accessed via a creepy, dim-lit stairwell. That doesn't stop those theater nerds, though. All right, everyone, we're going to round off our tour over on the Performance planes. This is where you'll be able to see the different behaviors of the Dictimus Dramaticon, both verbally and non-verbally. Let's shed some light on the subject, shall we? Not many people are aware of this, but the theater community has a vocabulary entirely its own. For most people, it's hard to learn, but if you follow along with me today, you might just get the hang of it. Are you ready? Here we go. In is down, down is front, out is up, up is back, off is out, on is in, right is left, and left is right. Got it? Great. Now that you know the verbal side of communication, let's move on to nonverbal. In theater, nonverbal communication is a must, especially for stage managers. They have several different actions that they use to communicate with their actors on stage, including the bat ears, which is usually used to say, Speak up, honey, we can't quite hear you. Second, we have the hyperventilating chipmunk, which is usually used to say, speed up a bit, toots, or keep pushing through, slugger. Third, we have the elbowing a fat man on an airplane, which is usually used to say, scooch over a bit, snookums, you're being blocked, and not in the good way. And finally, we have the dog whose belly is being rubbed, which is usually used to say something like, thank God, act one is over. Well, everyone, that wraps it up for today. We hope you enjoyed learning more about the Dictimus Dramaticus and its different appearances, habitats, and behaviors. We hope you enjoyed tonight's program, and join us again tomorrow for a special look at our Pandora's Instructoress, the teacher. Thank you, and have a great night.